learning packages to okay, learn. Okay, daw siya. Kapag balik face to face na. One cell phone in the family. Kapag nalang mag-aaral, manahirapan ako. Thank you. Friends and colleagues, let us put our hands together for Ms. Camille C. Navarro. Hello everyone, good afternoon. Good afternoon, Professor Hello, AJ. Hello, Camille, how are you? I'm fine. I'm quite excited, but I have to admit, quite nervous as well. Yes, it's a brand new platform it that is, we have in our is. annual university convocation. Mom Camille, you, such have, you have an immense task as our planning director, and I think your discussion this afternoon will shed light to our path and see how our university will traverse into the new normal or to the better normal. I'm glad you said that, Professor AJ. Um, it's actually just been a month and a half, more or less, um, with the Planning and Development Center. So quite frankly, I'm still learning the ropes as well. But I've been meeting, listening to a lot of brilliant minds. And um, not just brilliant minds. I would have to say it's a combination of brilliant minds, meticulous minds, creative minds, passionate minds. And um, the amalgamation of all that somehow allows you to learn the process uh, better and understand the process better. So hopefully with everybody's help, uh, we'll really uh, push forward into the best normal even. Definitely if all of us here, do you agree? Yeah. Have brilliant yeah. minds as well as our faculty members joining us. Ma'am Camille, I believe that your presentation is anchored on the Foresight Conference uh, done early this year. Can you tell us more about the Foresight Conference before we dig in the details of your presentation? Right. Uh, Professor AJ, uh, the foresight, it happened back in April. For those um, who don't know it yet, we might have audience in Facebook who, uh, who are hearing it for the first time. We're hoping not, but in, in case uh, that is the case, um, it's actually a meeting, uh, a sit-down, a sit-down of a, a meeting of the minds, a meeting of the future minds, if I may say, because it was really a time dedicated to discuss about the future of our university. So um, I'll expound more on that later right. on as well. Truly, our leaders, no less than our management committee, set our direction, as mentioned by our uh, president earlier, heading us all to our better normal, of course, the end in mind will be education recovery. Camille, I think we can now dig in the details of your uh, insights coming from the Foresight Conference. That's right. Um, thank you for that, Professor AJ. But before I go to the meat of the matter, um, I'm also tasked to... Uh, somehow give a glimpse of our uh, theme for the afternoon, for the day rather, which is education recovery. And um, to do that, um, actually if you read UNESCO uh, websites or UNICEF websites or organizations under the World, Bra World Bank rather, they have their own guidebooks for this one. But for today's presentation, I, uh, I borrowed from Global Facility for Disaster Reduction and Recovery and mainly its points remind us that education recovery allows us to remember that we must maintain the core functions amid, amidst crisis, allow for a streamlined recovery from shocks, minimize disaster and conflict, and improve the sector's adaptation and resilience to future crisis. And I would have to say, and maybe the audience would agree with me as well, that the University of Makati has successfully done the first three bullets. Mm -hmm. We've maintained operations, faculty, you were able to teach, even pivot to an online learning setup. Uh, support offices, we're not just able to support, but also pivot as well with whatever the needs of the stakeholders are. So the next thing we also have to bear in mind would probably bu be bullet number four, which is to improve the sector's adaptation and resilience to future crisis. Because let's face it, the pandemic is just maybe the start. We don't know what's going to happen next. Um, actually, we've been talking about the pandemic as an endemic already, but mm -hmm. we have monkeypox also in the horizon. Um, if you subscribe to news feeds, uh, say Nikkei, 
uh, Asia. They talk about China testing their missiles. So it's really a variety of things. And um, though they're not very close to home geographically, it's something that we as a university may have to also consider and prepare for. So another thing is, um, I think it was also mentioned earlier that there are learning gaps Definitely. to, or gaps, not just learning, gaps to address. And maybe that's why uh, the foresight was really a good, um, a, a good sit down because it allows everyone to chip in, pitch their thoughts. It even allowed each other to um, pick brains, so to speak, on what could really be done or what the university could really do collectively. 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 Right. So may I continue? Sorry. Not very used to the clicker yet. But um, there you go. There you go. Uh, let me introduce you to Woody Wade. Um, he's actually a Swedish uh, strategic planner. Um, he talks about scenario planning a lot. And I'm just going to touch the surface, not really something comprehensive. But he poses the question to everyone. What could the landscapes of the future look like? Now, notice that could, the words could and could landscape, possibly. right, are emphasized. Because it tells us that you, you cannot define the future. So we have to be ready with any um, eventuality. And the word landscapes also tells us that we have to picture every possible contingen contingency. It would be your um, plan B, so to speak, contingency plans, but um, maybe to put it in a scientific name, so to speak, let's call it for this afternoon. Or it could be from A to Z. Or A to Z, <laughs> not just plan B, you're correct. Right. And that's how he also uh, looked at it. So in a way, for the rest of the afternoon, you'll also hear from the other speakers, and they will put these things together as well on how we could somehow really remember to all be um, recoverers of education. So that, um, and I hope that somehow the scenario planning idea would um, help you um, connect that to the rest of the speakers this afternoon. All right, so to continue, um, his framework of uh, scenario planning, and this is just the surface, um, he wants everyone to look at driving forces, and he calls the driving forces uh, political, economic, societal, and technological. So now, quite frankly, he <laughs> added an E for environmental. And I think in our country, it's very much um, applicable. But I didn't put the E because Mom Juvie from HR might call me out if I put another E. Because it <laughs> would be <laughs> And the acronym <laughs> would become PESTE. <laughs> right. But um, quite frankly, though, um, I think the PEST word is app. Because if you have PEST, what do you do? You're, you're meant to respond to it. You're meant to do something about it. So um, political, for instance, the first driving force, I won't, um, I, I think they're very much um, simple in terms of idea, but say political, and may I ask your professor, AJ, if I say political driving force, what's the first thing that would come to your mind? I think the most glaring political arena that we are in now would be the change in administration, because mm -hmm. climate change in administration would be change in policies, directions, but probably uh, that challenge question could also be posted to our audience both uh, here at Room 507 and to our audience in Zoom. So later they could give in their insights if, and if they have questions. Definitely. We welcome everyone to engage truly. So, but you're correct. Um, we're looking at it in a national sense when you say change of administration. But we can also look at, it, look at it in a geopolitical sense. There's an ongoing war in Ukraine. Right. Maybe far from home, but will that affect us? Um, right, so missiles are be, being tested in China, not so close to home, but close enough to be worried. So things like that. So it's the same thing with economic, because there's an ongoing war, our prices of gas going to go up or down. It recently went down, but how, how long will that be? Will that affect our students or our stakeholders? Most definitely. I think that's why there was a request of a shuttle from one of the... Uh, student, represent, uh, student representatives earlier. Societal, a lot of our students are native, uh, digi digital natives. They were born <laughs> with uh, cell phones in their hands already. And how do we adjust to that? Uh, there was an emphasis on, um, by our speaker this morning on putting mental breaks, um, allowing faculty to also breathe. It's not just the students, actually. You're going to be online for a very long time, or it will be hybrid. Uh, for quite a while. So we also have to structure 
where do we put the mental rest right. so that we could really assimilate and accommodate all this information that we're gathering from each other. So technological is quite obvious. So things like that. Um, I think when you, deal, when you have to deal with the driving forces, you have to deal with the pest. And I think using the same acronyms, we can also jumble the letters. And what would be the next step? Right, so uh, jumble the letters together, what would be the next step? So he just wants to, uh, Woody Wade, uh, through scenario planning, reminds us to uh, somehow put it in a matrix, and um, I just did, it, did this very loosely. So say we were to decide, um, are we going to have an online or hybrid class versus a face-to-face -face class setup? So what are the driving forces that we have to consider? You can add more of yours, definitely. I'm sure you can fill up the whole page. But uh, what am I trying to um, bring in the conversation? I think if we look at it in a scenario planning matrix way, it's actually very easy to, to, to give your ideas, to give your suggestions, and these suggestions would actually also benefit um, planning, the university as a whole. So what I place there is, um, do we um, adjust to the students who work part-time if we are to consider the online classes. I just got the data this morning that we actually have 1,810 so far as of today uh, students who are working students. And I've heard faculty from time to time share that um, they would even have to be the one to stop the student from uh, driving while being an online class. Or some faculty have also shared that because um, they're far from home, it will take a while to do the commute, they actually do their presentation while they're on the bus. So things like that are factors that we may have to consider. How frequent should they be in the campus? Uh, again, the mental health breaks that's needed for both faculty and the students. Uh, the support of the offices. How are we going to mainstream it? How are we going to op make it optimized? Um, so on and so forth. So I also placed we could put other challenges, we could put other opportunities, and definitely from the opportunities, we could put um, initiatives and um, innovations that we might want to, uh, add, sorry, to add. So as we continue the conversation in education, on rec uh, education recovery, I hope that these things would be helpful as well. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, we pose this question to That's everyone. That's another challenge question for That's our right. audience. So, Professor uh, AJ, are you ready for the landscapes of the future? We should say yes. <laughs> we or we're in the process of all getting ready for the new landscape. But we have to recover first as an educational institution. Right. I agree with you. And I think it's a, a question that all of us would have to continue answering. Right. All right. And I think uh, even before uh, our AUC today, that's also the reason why our brilliant minds did the sit down for the foresight. And that's what um, I will discuss next. I'm tasked to discuss that next, sorry. So again, back in April, um, we had to decide the direction that the university uh, would go on and continue forth. And it began through the opening remarks with a call from our uh, OAC president that we are targeting to be the first local universe, uh, sorry, local, University. University, so to and be ranked to worldwide, be, right, right, to be ranked worldwide, and um, there was also a mention that we may have to revisit the mission and vision, that uh, to because we've already been uh, meeting our mission and vision. So how much further do we want to take it now? And I think this morning, when we listen to the KKK, it's very much in line right. with the need to re um, revisit the mission and vision. So. How did the rest of the speakers uh, respond that day? So may I uh, go through some of, this th uh, some of the talks that also happened uh, during the foresight? I think I might have to, oh, there you go. So uh, first was from uh, Dr. Jason Bergania, who's also uh, One going of to our speak, speakers, right, later. right, this afternoon. And uh, Dean Dennis Sandoval, and this is a reminder actually, their talk is a reminder of how we should really be in an accreditation state of mind if we really want to reach that um, institutional recognition status. First the, first the um, C COPCs, and then next we move on to the in, uh, institutional recognition. Now, 
I think um, when I was going through the minutes, what's uh, minutes of this meeting, what really struck me was if you do a control F and type in the word culture, it appeared seven times. So what does that tells, tell us? It really That's interesting. Interesting, right? So it means that several of us, several of uh, those who were in that meeting really found it necessary to define what culture we would like. But speaking of culture as well, there was also an emphasis on the culture of documentation. Because if we are to really succeed in uh, doing the accreditations, we must be mindful of how we uh, um, do our documentation, whether it's processes, whether it's um, events such as this, who will write about this today, or who will write about what we will do after this. So um, documentation state of mind for the accreditation state of mind, if I may say so. Uh, what's also interesting, uh, Professor AJ, is that happened in April. Mm -hmm. But if I may, I may I look, uh, may I use my cheat sheets? Sure. Cheat sheets, very old school. That's very part of documentation. Th that's part of documentation. Which our president <laughs> underscored early this morning. <laughs> so thank you for understanding <laughs> the several sheets of paper. Thank you also to the different offices who, who uh, supported and assisted this need for documentation. But if I may, if I may, Lots of data here and graphs and... Uh, but we have to intently listen to that because that would serve as our direction for the next couple of academic years, probably. That's right. Now, I think I lost that particular documentation. But anyway, point being, um, that happened in April and come August, when it comes to accreditation, and maybe Dr. Bergani, you could also help me out here. We've already had um, several COPCs done. Several, Congratulations, right, and right, and I think that should be a big round of applause to everyone. <laughs> Several of the other programs are also being reviewed by Chet already. Advanced congratulations. Advanced congratulations, <laughs> and some programs are just awaiting the second review, the second review of the pro uh, of their program. So, hey, April, May, June, July, August. From foresight, we could actually say that it's coming to fruition already. And um, that's, uh, I think, in terms of impact, that says a lot, so to speak. It, it, it got us moving. The, that sit down got everyone moving. Definitely. Right, so. Not to mention, we still have the Alcohol accreditation. All right, so <laughs> when I asked uh, Dr. Bergania the other day, so while we're doing the waiting game, what's next? Prepare for Alcohol, right. for prepare for the next mountain, so to speak. All right, so next would be crafting the university's research agenda, some insights, and this is from uh, Professor Ederson Tapia. And um, of course, it was the emphasis to really be a culture of research, so going back to uh, culture again, that we would really, especially faculty, we really would have to engage in uh, research, and mindful research, not just any research. Uh, not just the list of topics that we want to achieve, but again, collectively, be mindful of what we really want to target or what we really want to um, uh, reach as research goals. So uh, that was the emphasis given by uh, the talk. And then, sorry. <laughs> Next would be institutionalizing greatness in board examinations. And this was by Dean uh, Faye Ninette Carriaga and Dean Cecilia T. Duca. Um, this allows us to look at, it, look at things in a stakeholder's perspective, where we must be really helpful of our students the moment they um, enter our school until the uh, time that they're doing their board exams. And even after they do their board exams, listening to the alumna earlier that tells you a lot, how confident she was, how thankful she was, how um, the emphasis she gave in the pivot that the, the university was able to do. That says a lot about the support that we were able to give as a uh, university to the students. Um, there was, I think, also a discussion of how do we help the other students who do not make, uh, who don't, um, how do you put it, reach the admission criteria. criteria. So it's, uh, I think, will that still be our problem at the rate that you actually have 24,000 um, students who actually want to get in the university? We have 24, around 20,000 students who want to get in the university. So I think you have another, we have another happy problem 
in our hands. Um, next would be the classroom of tomorrow. Um, our, the speakers, uh, Dean Stanley Fernandez and Dr. Uh, Enrico Francisco, somehow um, called the pandemic as a blessing in disguise in the sense that um, it actually required us to maneuver and pivot. And uh, we were, the faculty was able to conduct the classes through the TBL hub. Uh, but th what's, the, what's next? The next question is how do we optimize it? How do we make it optimal for the students? Not just for the students actually, when you think about it, um, and I think this is one of the points that Dean Stanley would like to um, bring to, con to, com to communicate. From the city alone, there are several niche um, markets or niche offices that we could actually assist through our uh, TBL. And um, also, uh, talking about coming to fruition from, from uh, foresight to fruition, we're actually um, in the talks. I think we're just waiting for the MOE, if I'm correct, Dean, uh, because we actually have an outfit that would fit these needs and actually help address the TBL needs for those uh, specific niche markets. Um, on, another, on another hand, and I think it was very timely because we had the speaker earlier, Actually, sorry, it was actually OIC president who discussed it, um, how some of our papers are being forged or are, are fake. And um, I was right beside Dr. Birgania earlier, and we talked about blockchain. So, and I think um, before talking to Dr. Birgania, I s spoke with Dean Stanley, and he was also talking about blockchain. And somehow, um, in a knowledge management center sense, we could also uh, put the TBL in mind. So. A lot of things um, brewing, coming together, brewing, and even um, coming to fruition. More things coming to fruition. So next would be the special pa panel on strategic areas of concern, where uh, for SPMO, for uh, Ma'am Odinia talked about how we make it also more optimized, how we make the services uh, more streamlined. And there. Mr. Santiago also, um, Mr. Eller Santiago talked about how we should also assess our physical spaces when we do our planning. Um, ideally, we look at it in a two year um, timeline, but as we look at the two year timeline, we must also mindfully assess uh, our physical uh, structures. And Ms. Emma Datuin, Ma'am Emma, also talked about being responsible or taking into account how we should really properly craft the PPMP. And um, we're going to do, I, I think that's something that uh, is um, on the table currently for our friends from Biao. Mm -hmm. Next would be uh, UMAC towards nation building from v VP Hill Tabu. And um, it's interesting because um, when I also got to speak with him about it, um, he talked about how historically um, our extension services were somehow uh, compartmentalized, if I'm using the uh, word correctly. Uh, it, uh, we, we don't have a focus uh, community before, but somehow we've already worked on identifying one. And um, also in a student affairs perspective, uh, one of the challenges that is posed to the University of Makati is the student graduate attributes. So how uh, do we really want to define our students? So it goes back to the discussion of culture again. So um, I think it's getting more light because um, we've already identified uh, institutional objectives recently and I think this would be somehow, uh, if I understood the discussion right, a good springboard for how we could determine the graduate attributes. So next would be keeping uh, our edge out of the box from uh, Professor uh, Asel Herman and Professor Benosa. Um, I think um, this is where the idea of, uh, in their talk, you, the university always talks about um, being a purple cow and this is in reference to our uh, former president. But this time, um, Professor Herman and Professor Benosa challenged us. How could we be more purple? So in fact, when I was going through the minutes, we're not purple cow anymore. We're probably indigo. 
<laughs> because it's go going to be a deeper shade and therefore um, a deeper call for uh, challenge, so to speak. But um, when I was also going through the notes, um, there was emphasis on innovation and how the university could be a, um, an innovation hub or an incubation hub. And I, um, going back to foresight to fruition, that's one of the things that are actually in fruition right now because with the city government support, we actually have um, RICE, which, uh, which allows uh, the constituents of Makati to, uh, to come up with startup projects for those uh, in, uh, entrepreneurial minds, for, our cons uh, for residents, citizens, and students who are entrepreneurial in minds, we could consider the RICE incubation project. Now this is open to everyone, not just in Makati. I mean, this is open to Makati um, citizens. So maybe our friends from uh, CBFS, we could also enjoin our students to join this because this is actually seed money for their possible, um, correct, for their possible startups. Okay. So next, um, the Umac Plantilla and um, um, Juvi Hermosura pointed out the need to review and revisit, and I think it was also re-emphasized by our president earlier. That's good news <laughs> for all that, of us. Okay, I think um, you're speaking in behalf of everybody else also. <laughs> so on behalf of our audience. He, you're, you're the only one speaking though. Are they going to be happy about it too? Everyone. Everyone's going to be happy <laughs> about it, all right. When applicable. When applicable and skills are necessary, definitely. And uh, okay, but I'll, we'll allow our um, good HRMO office to review that. So bringing you back again to the dream, and um, that we would um, that we hope to collectively invite, enjoin, empower, and uh, passionately work hand in hand with everyone, and. Um, also, um, before I end the presentation, because we're very strictly right. uh, limited to 30 minutes, 30 to 45 in fact. We're still in time. Right? We are on time, correct. So, um, from purple cow to a tribe of herons. So, why did I choose this? Um, there's never been a week here that ends where I do not hear about the purple cow. And in various perspectives and in various ar arguments, um, uh, like, uh, are we, have we matured from being a purple cow? Or should we go a deeper shade, which is um, an indigo cow? <laughs> or do we consider being brown cows too to support the purple cow? Or have we actually defined what the cow is? Shouldn't it be a heron? <laughs> so in various <laughs> forms and in various uh, arguments and in various perspectives, but since Purple Cow was written by Seth Godin, um, before coming to the university, I may not have had the <laughs> pleasure of meeting our, the former president, but I was able to read tribes before I was able to read Purple Cow. So from the same writer uh, comes this um, quotation that I would like to share with everybody. And hopefully this gives us a bit of connection to how to our, uh, uh, to our muni muni, so to speak, of whether we're purple cows or maybe tribe of, a tribe of herons. So a tribe is a group of people connected to one another, connected to a leader, or in our case, connected to leaders, and connected to an idea. And that's by Seth Godin, who also wrote Purple Cow. So I leave that thought to everyone this afternoon in the hopes that we get to connect the cow to the herons. To the leader and to the idea. To the leader, to the idea, to the KKK, and to the world university rankings that we're hoping to be. Right. So thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very much, Ma'am Camille. It's such a very humongous task ahead of us, but definitely it's a task not just for each of us, but for all of us. So do we have any question coming from our live audience? Acknowledging Dean uh, Sandoval. <laughs> Hi, Camille. Hello, Dean. Let's try to reconcile uh, the discussion uh, a little while in the morning yung regarding the 
educational technology advancements. And considering in pursuit of our institutional recognition, we need to spend around 190 million pesos for the books in a, in a matter of six years. Tapos na, let's say it, it will be 2020, we have already fully complied. And by that time, at the end of that uh, particular decade, 2030, <coughs> digital library na, papa abolish na ng ano. So, how do you, what, what are your thoughts about the waste of resources later on? Just, of course, of course, we need to comply with these things for institutional recognition, and yet, because of the cause of modern technology, magiging worthless na yung mga hard copy books na yan. I'll try my best. Thank you for that question. Hello. Hello. Thank you for that question. I'll try my best to also answer that. Um, were we around though when Dr. Hawkson uh, discussed um, in Achieve? Because I think that would be a good reference. Um, as one of our like PNU al also does this, and I think what was nice is that she also shared that there were some pro she shared that there were some programs that really also did not meet the requirements of CHED rather easily, and um, but she also mentioned and it struck me because it's the same thing I also heard 20 years ago. Like um, w when we get schools accredited, CHED somehow also has um, certain old school I I ideas and customs themselves. And yet we would have to follow them because that's really the path that we oh. would have to take. But, uh, but I understand as well your um, emphasis on the digital Same library. In fact, I was thinking, would SHED, if collectively, like all the schools who would want their programs, um, what do you call this? Recognized. Re recognized, thank you. Uh, if collectively we actually did the survey that majority of the learners now really just do it digitally, because let's face it, I mean, I talk to a lot of the new grads and they tell me they've not really um, held the book in quite a while. So would that sway Ched? Do you think, Dr. Birganya, that would chase uh, sw sw <laughs> <laughs> Of course, if you did. <laughs> but anyway, but basically that. Um, there are still things that, in the first place, that's what they require and therefore we must follow for the meantime. Not very purple cow in nature, but maybe when we reach when we reach and when we've get, uh, gotten ourselves accredited, we can go to that um, indigo cow, so to speak, or we, we could already dream bigger and dream further. But yes, um, I think babalik I will also reference to one of the things that the president said earlier that pag uh, pinaghirapan natin, mamahalin natin. And I guess uh, this is part of that. It's difficult, it's challenging, maybe eventually we think of it as a waste, but actually it won't be a waste if we find an extension, uh, 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 a community to give the books to eventually. So, and I think a lot of um, um, communities would actually be very thankful for these books. And Mom Camille, I think that would serve also as an alternative reference or resources for our students, in addition to the printed copies of the book. Right. We can still put it into use. Mm -hmm. Our rich library collection. Yeah. If Thank you, you do, uh, sorry to add to add to that. I mean, um, I've not gone to Europe. <laughs> it's also a dream, an aspiration. But when friends do send pictures, it's really more hard copy books exactly. than digital. So, I, I think the challenge is how do we really encourage the love for reading? The, more that perhaps than what will happen to the hard copy books. Thank you, Ma'am Camille. Thank you, Dean Sandoval, for your question. Thank you. Do we have uh, additional questions from our live audience? Or probably our virtual audience could also send their questions via either via Zoom or via Facebook uh, comment. Okay. Seeing no hand uh, raised. Again, we thank you, uh, Ma'am Camille, and you shall expect that all of us are looking at the same direction to guide our actions and even aspirations. Thank, thank you, you, Professor AJ and AUC. Thank you for having me. Good thank afternoon. Thank you.